that song has a, a great uh, message to it, and um, it, it, it's a prescription, if you will, and we're going to talk about some more prescriptions today. It's a prescription, if you will, that if you, if you really grasp the meaning of that song, it'll take care of a lot in your life. It really will. More and more and more and more, we need to be getting closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ. And if we will do that, then I think that we'll find there's a lot that will be taken care of in our lives. One of the things that, um, that we struggle with, all of us struggle with, and, and Christians are not exempt uh, at all, is this thing called worry. We worry. We worry about a lot. We let things get under our skins, and, and, and we begin to, to kind of see that, <clears throat> that it carries us down this path of anxiety, and then this path of anxiety leads to a path of depression, and then the path of depression leads us to all kinds of problems. Even physical problems come out of this. It, it, it brings about this thing called fear, and fear causes us to do really weird things and make a lot of stupid choices, decisions with choices that we have in our life because we're, we're, we're fearful of all kinds of things that, that make really no sense in our lives. And there's even, you know, physical reactions uh, like, like headaches. Uh, people get headaches. People get stomach aches. People get nauseous and, and maybe even nervous shakes because this thing can be so overwhelming. The word worry is actually derived from two different Greek words, and one of those words, the first word, means to divide, and the second word means mind. And so worry actually is when your mind is divided between legitimate thoughts, things that are actually realistic, and those things that are not. And those things that are not become destructive in our lives. The word Paul uses is synonymous um, to worry. Paul uses the word anxious, anxious. And whenever we look at what anxiousness does, it becomes destructive in our lives. It, it drives us harder and harder in our lives. And the reason that we become anxious it usually happens because we're, we're thinking about some future event that we think is coming, right? We, we begin to think about what the outcome is going to be, about how we're going to take care of what's going to come in the future, about how we know the, the, the things that are going to happen, and we really don't. You know, what I've, what I've realized um, in my uh, lifetime is that I don't know the future. I don't know what God's plan for tomorrow is. I don't know the circumstances or the events that I'm going to be dealing with. Even from the time that I leave this building here, things will happen that I'm not aware of. God has given me this moment, this moment right now to live and to enjoy your presence and to enjoy the presence of God himself and to bask in the fact that, that we have been given an opportunity to gather together as a church family and worship together and fellowship together. We don't know the future, and we don't know the circumstances that lie ahead. And you know what happens most of the time, and, and Diane and I have talked about this, this issue of anxiety, of, of consciously uh, causing us to, to go into turmoil in our lives is something that Satan and his minions use to drive a wedge between us and God. You see, because then we begin to think, oh, I'm going to be taking care of this. Oh, I need to do this, or I need to do that, or uh, what am I going to do next? And, you know, uh, what happens? What am I going to do whenever this happens, or whenever this happens? Well, I can't do anything. It has to be God. And we have to continue to rely on God and de depend on God and not let Satan drive that wedge between us and God. We can only live the life that he has given us today and you know this thing of anxiety is reaching epic proportions it seems it seems like that everywhere you go every every person you talk to is anxious about something they're worrying about something and and it, it, it's just it, it's something that we can do something about Paul is going to tell us today he's going to he's going to say this is the problem here's the prescription for the problem this is what you do with it and this is the outcome. If you will follow what I'm telling you, this is what will happen. 
So let's look at our scripture text. It's in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So what is the problem? What is the pro- problem? The, Paul says the problem is anxiety. There's a lot going on in Philippi at this particular time that's causing the church there, obviously, to be anxious about things. You know, you had a couple of people in the church that were uh, at each other's throat a little bit. You had the Judaizers that were coming in and trying to tell them a false doctrine, confusing them with regard to being Christians. You had Nero, who at the time was the the Roman emperor, who was turning up the burner on persecution, and you had all of this going on, and and, and the people um, in the church of, of Philippi were anxious. And so no wonder Paul writes this letter to them, and in this letter he says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Now, this was not a new teaching. This, this was actually something that Paul was literally uh, saying that Jesus had, had said uh, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. So Paul is writing this to the Philippians, kind of quoting Jesus, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. A doctor once conducted a long-term study about people who were anxious and people who worried And he discovered the following. He discovered that 40% of the people worried about things that never came to pass. He discovered that 30% of the people worried about things in the past over which they had no control whatsoever. He discovered that 12% worried about their health even though they had no illness. He discovered 10% worried about families, friends, and neighbors, though without really any substantial reason. And then he discovered that 8% of those studied actually had a legitimate cause to worry or to be concerned about something in their life. So if you add up the numbers, uh, there's about 92% of those that he studied were worrying for no reason at all. That's a lot of people worrying over nothing. Paul says, look, even when you have a legitimate concern, don't worry. And he gives us a prescription for handling anxiety. So the problem is anxiety, and the prescription is also found in verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The problem is anxiety. I like to call it fret. You know, you're fretting. Why are you fretting? You don't need to be fretting. Don't fret over that. Don't fret over this. That's what these people were doing. They were fretting, and Paul says, don't fret. Don't be fretting, folks. But in everything, in everything. Now, I could, I could you know, go into this long um discourse on what everything means, but everything means everything. It's not just the small stuff. It's not just the big stuff. It's not just the, the real hard stuff. It's everything, everything in life, Paul says, but in everything. It's, it's, it's everything, but in everything, but in everything by prayer. So what is prayer? Prayer is spending time talking with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's spending time communicating with a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, 
They're sovereign over everything. God is sovereign. He is the sovereign God of the universe. God created everything. God sustains everything. God gave us breath to breathe this morning. God caused the, the blood in our bodies to continue to circulate. The little ticker is continuing to tick. Our eyes, our little peepers opened this morning. We got out of bed. That was all God. God gave, God gave us clothes to wear. He gave us food to eat. He gave us means to come together, to be together, to worship him and to fellowship with each other. God did all of that. And a lot of people say, no, God didn't do that. I got up and I put my clothes on. Yo, where'd you get the clothes? Well, I, I got a job, and so I got money, and so I bought my clothes. Well, where'd you get the job? Well, the, this man gave me a job. Well, how did that man know to give you a job? How did you have enough sense to even get a job? God. God did it. God. God gives us everything. God is our salvation. God is our righteousness. God is our peace. God is our joy. God is my provider. God is my healer. I don't pray to a weak God. I don't go out and talk to a weak God that can't do anything. My God is a big God. I go out and I talk to God because I know that he can handle whatever it is that I need to talk to him about. He does on a daily basis. He hears me and he answers my prayers. Now, sometimes those answers are no. Sometimes those answers are not right now. Sometimes those answers are yes, but he always hears me and he always answers somehow. When I pray, whenever I talk to him, I don't want to spend time talking to a God that can't do anything. But a lot of people do. My God's big. My God's a big God. It, it, it takes a big God to handle some of the mess that I get myself into. And he does it. He's a big God. He can handle anything. He loves me. And he cares for me, and he hears me whenever I call out to him. He's in control of my life, and he wants to hear from me, and it's the same with you. He is in control of your life, and he wants to hear from you. He wants you to talk to him. And so the Apostle Paul says, we're to pray about everything. Now, Paul uses, uses three words here to talk about prayer. The first word that he uses, prayer, is actually... is, is um, more of uh, um, a word that denotes worship. And so the first thing that Paul is saying is, look, whenever you go and talk to God, worship him. Worship him. He is certainly worthy of worship. We should open up any dialogue with him with, you are a great and mighty God. Sovereign are you. You created all of this. You created all of nature. Nature just, just longs for the time whenever you're going to return and, and put all of this back like you meant for it to be in the beginning anyway. You are great and mighty. You hang the stars and you know them all by name. You are phenomenal, God, in the way that you just carry us through every day. Great are you, mighty are you, and I worship you. And then Paul says, Supplication, prayer that is supplication. And this word kind of denotes an action that if you, that if you look at it is, is one of asking for something earnestly and humbly. It is going before the sovereign God of the universe and pouring out your heart to him and telling him what is on your mind. It doesn't necessarily have to be a need. But just tell him what you're feeling and how things are going and what he, what he can do about it and, and, and just, just lay it out there on the line to him. God, I, I'm, I'm sad today. God, I, 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 I'm thinking about and praying about a certain couple and, and I, just, I want you to intervene somehow, just somehow or another just intervene. God, I, I, I have the pregnancy center on my mind today, and I pray, I pray, I pray that you would give the words to Stephanie that whenever a, a woman walks in today who is seeking an abortion, that she, through the Holy Spirit working in her life, would be able to turn that decision around. Lay it out there to him. Tell him what it is that you want him to know. That is supplication. Genuinely sincerely, earnestly, from the heart, humbly, 
asking him and telling him what's on your mind. And then the third word he uses is thanksgiving. I call it the attitude of gratitude. Whenever you pray, whenever you talk to God, finish it up with the attitude of gratitude. God, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this day. Thank you so much for, for allowing me to have one more day with my friends and family. Thank you, God, for the food that you allowed to, to go on our table. Thank you, God, that I had gas that I could even go to work. Thank you, God, that I had clothes that I could get up. Thank you, God. We said this the other night whenever, whenever Diane and I got back from Knoxville. Keaton had called us, and he said, we, we don't have any water. And I'm like, oh, no, man, Really? We checked the water. We did everything. We checked every, every point in that line coming up to the house. I checked. There was no pressure in the house. There was no pressure on the water faucets. There was no cutoff. That was problems. And there was, everything looked like it was supposed to look. I went to CB and bought 40 bazillion gallons of water and didn't have any place to put it. And it's all sitting around on the cabinets. We're about to drink all of it. We spent a lot of time in the bathroom, and y'all didn't need to know that, I know, but... And I'm thinking, you know, after going down and checking the water meter out at the road, and that's kind of a little bit of a haul from our house, and I'm thinking, oh, no, what if, what if Russia bombs us with an EMP and I'm going to have all these gallons of water just strapped on my back going down to the creek every day, you know? And, and, and just a little bit of a rabbit trail. I, I went back down and checked the water meter one more time and realized that it was turned off. Somebody had turned the water meter off, and... I turned it back on, and I had Diane on the phone, and she starts going, we got water! <laughs> An attitude of gratitude. Thank you, God, that we got water. I mean, we could actually take a shower the next morning. It was wonderful. Give God thanks in all things and for everything. Now, sometimes that looks upside down, doesn't it? Especially whenever things aren't going the way that you think they need to go. You're supposed to go to God and say, God, thank you. Yes. Yes, why not? He's the sovereign God of the universe. He's the one that, that can take care of exactly what it is that you're going through. Give him thanks and glory and honor in all things. So those are the three things that Paul says we need to do. Prayer with worship. And then, and then through supplication, go to God and tell him what it is that's on our heart and our mind and then end it with thanksgiving. Now, the first one and the last one, the, the worshipful prayer and the prayer of thanksgiving, it's really hard to be worrying and fretting if you're worshiping and thanking. That's just a little side note for you there. So don't be anxious, but through prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. And so what do we do with it? Paul has a, a twofold program, if you will, to help us deal with this this thing that um, controls our minds. He says that you've got to get control of what you think, how you're thinking. I heard it called one time stinking thinking. We don't want to be stinking thinking. We want to control what we're thinking about. And, and, and let me kind of share with you this illustration that I, I've read across uh, this week, there was a plastic surgeon. He was very successful. He, he, uh, his line of work was to take people who had, um, who had you know, badly burned faces or had been in some kind of real horrible accident and, and their face had been really messed up. And he, he just had this ability, uh, a God-given ability to go in and, and wonderfully reconstruct things. And he noticed something in most of his patients after coming back and, and talking with them, they all in their minds continued to see the scarred face. Even holding a mirror up in front of them and seeing the marvelous reformation of what he had been able to do in their minds, they still saw the scarred face. He said sometimes it would even take longer than two years for these people to readjust the way that they think. You see, the mind is a very powerful thing. And sometimes we have to reprogram that thing in order to see things through God's perspective the way that reality should be and not the way that we think we're seeing it. So we have to be committed 
if you will, to feeding our minds with God's truth in order to live in a world of reality and not destructive deception. Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You've got to get rid of those anxious thoughts and replace them with spiritual thoughts that will lead us to peace. And, and Paul gives us, uh, gives us a lineup of what those are. In verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So let's look at those. Whatever is true, he says. Truth means genuine, sincere, and true to God. It's reality from God's perspective. So make things true to yourself by examining truth from God's perspective and think about that. What is truth from God's perspective? There's a lot that just jumps off of the page as you read God's word that speaks to truth. So read his word and think about those things that are true. Secondly, he says, whatever is honorable, whatever is honest, whatever is noble, whatever is worthy of respect. You know, we as Christians are often supposed to do good deeds. We're supposed to glorify God with our lives. So think on these things. Think about your life, how your life is going in those areas of your life where there are noble things that you've done and honest things that you've done and things where you have genuinely tried to glorify God. Think about those things. Number three, he says, whatever is just. Just means according to God's divine standards. Righteous. Righteousness is a right standing with God. And the thing in your life that gives you a right standing before God is Jesus Christ. So think about Jesus Christ. Think on Jesus and and think about being Christ-like in your daily life. What is it that you need to do in order to be Christ-like in your daily life? Think about those things. Number four, he says, whatever is pure. Pure means clean. Pure means without defilement. Above reproach, if you will. It's it's holiness. Think on the areas of your life where you have worked hard to live a clean and holy and, and righteous life above reproach. Think about those things. Number five, he says, whatever is lovely. Lovely means beautiful and orderly, not chaotic or confusing. Um, and, and lovely is easy for me. Uh, thinking about lovely, I just think about Diane. And man, it just goes away. Just the, all, of my, all of my life problems just go right out the window. I think about Diane. I do. Not chaotic, not confusing. No drama. If you've got drama in your life, get rid of it. That's not lovely. Think on those aspects of your life that are beautiful and orderly. Number six, whatever is commendable. The King James Version says of good report. Commendable means things that are well thought out, things with a good reputation. Think on those things in your life that are commendable. Now, you're not typically going to find any of these things in the world. The world is not going to be able to hand you any of these things that Paul says that we need to think on. So don't depend on necessarily those people around you to provide these things for you. You got to take control of your own life. You got to take control of your own thought life and program your mind with your own input in order to override what the world delivers and bombards our minds with every day. You have to do that. You have to do that. And a great way to get started is to commit to yourself that you're going to read God's Word every day. Get into a Bible reading program. And if you don't have one, if 
you can't find one, please, please, please come to me and let me know because I can put you on some that are so easy to do. Just read God's word every day. And that's a great way to get started. So that was the first thing. Take control of what you think. And then Paul says, take control of what you do. In verse 9, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So it's easier to get control of what you do whenever you are in control of what you think. He encourages us and the Philippians again to do the things that we have seen him do. And, and you know, that was easy for them to do because they knew about all of the hardships that, that Paul had gone through. And Paul says, you know, uh, just, just what you've learned from me, what you've received from me, what you've heard from me, and what you've seen in my life. Shipwrecked, beaten, thrown in jail, all kinds of, of adversity has come his way, and they, they have known about it, and they have seen how he came out of every season of his life. And he says, just, just use me as a role model, and we need to do the same as well. So lastly, Paul says, this is the outcome. If you'll do these things that I'm telling you about, if you will, will truly put this into perspective and make it a part of your life, this is the outcome. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the, the peace of God, the God of peace, begins to protect your heart and mind. God's protection is, is peace. God's presence is always there. The, the, the God of peace is with you. And if the God of peace is with you, he can certainly allow his peace to be on you. It's his presence that furnishes the peace. Does that make sense to you? His presence around you, recognizing that he is with you, that he is among us right now, is what furnishes his peace. Without, without embracing his presence, it's hard to have his peace. And then Paul promises that his peace will be there to guard us. Now let me say this. It's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Whenever God's peace falls on you like this, the peace that surpasses all understanding, people who are not Christians are not going to understand that. And you can even try your hardest to explain it to them, and they're not going to get it. They're just not going to understand. And they're going to look at you sometimes like you're crazy, like like. What is going on with this person? He has lost his ever-loving mind, and he's just reacting, you know, in, in this, this stupid way because, because he can't stand up to the pressure of handling it. No, 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 that's, that's, that's not it. It's because of the peace of God that surpasses all understanding that is now on me that I'm able to withstand the pressures of dealing with what's going on. And this little song keeps coming back to my mind. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer in him. Will I trust Praise the name of Jesus. And then you just take a deep breath and find that peace that surpasses all understanding. Now I'm going to close in a little bit of a different way today as, as Keaton comes on back up. I mentioned... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount earlier, Matthew chapter 6, 
And I'm going to read a section out of that, uh, verses 25 through 34, to close with today. And I have it for you available on the screens as well. Now, before I read this, I want you to understand that this is the Jesus that Hannah was singing about. This is Jesus talking. Jesus is telling us this today. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for, its, for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now that's, that's the words from Jesus. <laughs> And if Jesus says, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. If Jesus says, don't fret, don't fret. I promise you, he can handle it. He can take care of it. Talk to him and let him know it. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this scripture that you have given us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence and for just walking through this place. Oh, Father God, we just love you so much. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you that you've given us yet another day to live among your people and to enjoy your blessings. Father, now I pray that you would just plant this message deeply in our hearts for this is something that we all contend with and, and Paul has given us now this, this program, this prescription to handle this worrying, this fretting, this anxiousness in our lives. May we put it back into your hand and let you handle it and breathe a sigh of relief as we live in the peace that passes all understanding in Christ Jesus name we pray right now amen <laughs>